Hello, this is episode 61 of the Everything History Podcast, the Egyptian Expedition and the First Peloponnesian War, Pentecontactia Part 2, 460 to 435 BCE. That's a long title, sorry about that, but a whole lot happens in this episode and I wanted to try and encapsulate as much as possible in the title. And as you also heard, this episode is the second and final on the Pentecontitia, and therefore, when I finish this episode, you will be fully informed and ready for the Great Peloponnesian War. I discharge my last duty as king and emperor. This is Everything History. Everything you hold worthwhile is in the name. We meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Last episode left off shortly after the exile of Chimon, the rise of Pericles in Athens, the end of the Helot Rebellion in Spartan territory, and the beginning of the construction of the Athenian Long Walls. That brought us round about the year 460 BCE, and by that year the Delian League was clearly dominated by Athens, so much so that it is more apt to call it the Athenian Empire. The Athenians, with their retinue of allies and or subjugated client city-states, were entering the height of their powers, often referred to as the Athenian Golden Age, or the Periclean Golden Age. Certainly it was a remarkable and interesting time, but to call it a Golden Age is strange. For a time to be gilded, I think of peace, dominance, and prosperity in said state. But the Athenian Golden Age, which can be marked arbitrarily from about 461 to 427 BCE, was not a time of peace and the only prosperity was amongst the Athenians themselves. But even then we have to stretch our definition of prosperity. In truth, this stretch of decades is referred to as a golden age because it was the strongest a Greek polis, that is a city-state, ever was during the classical era. And also because it involved Pericles, who later writers of antiquity drooled over for some reason. And also lastly, because it came right before the Great Peloponnesian War. There's also the cultural aspect, too. Some of the most famous playwrights in history were active during this time. Sophocles, Euripides, Aeschylus, for example. But, while Athens burned brightly during this time, they meddled with and brought pain to many other Mediterranean peoples. Not to be a bummer, but it is quite true. So allow me to turn back to the narrative. Athens had just accepted the important city-state of Megara into their empire. A strategically significant move because Megara was previously allied with Sparta and resided between Corinth and Athens along the Corinthian Gulf. This disturbed the Corinthians because Megara was a great rival of theirs, and the Epidaurians, who also resided along the Corinthian Gulf, were angered by this significantly as well because it was clear that Athens was breaching local politics and their traditional zones of influence. And the move also provoked Sparta because it stripped them of another ally and unbalanced the unsteady peace between the Peloponnese and the territories controlled by Athens. It is clear that Athens knew that this was a provocation because they installed their own soldiers at Megara. Alongside all this, Greek politics were also escalated by external foreign affairs in mid-460 BCE. For, as it happened, a rebel king in Libya named Inaros began a rebellion in Egypt with the goal of stripping Egypt from the Persian Empire. Inaros had sent an emissary to Athens asking for assistance in his so-called noble rebellion. Athens, always looking for a fight and opportunities for power, agreed, expecting such a fight with Persia to go as the previous wars had, and so began the six-year-long Egyptian expedition by Athens. Some 200 Athenian triremes embarked from the Athenian Empire to fight in Egypt, a massive enterprise. But Pericles and the Athenians were soon to learn that the Persian Empire was very much still a mighty entity. This expedition set sail in late 460 BCE. As the Egyptian expedition set sail, tensions flared up in Corinth and Epidaurus against Athens. Likely seeing an opportunity with the Athenian navy occupied elsewhere, the Corinthians and Epidaurians declared war on Athens. Fearing an attack or invasion of Attica itself, it appears that the Athenians pulled their force from Megara to bolster Athens and Attica itself. When the Corinthians heard this, they marched on Megara, but in expectation, the Athenians somehow mustered a force of elderly men and young boys to march and protect Megara. At the same time, the Epidorians assembled their ships and set about the Corinthian Gulf. In response to all these events, the island of Aegina declared war against Athens as well. Aegina, by the way, was a sizable island between Epidaurus and Athens. Even with all these states together, and Athens being occupied in Egypt, such a wide-ranging war was still in Athens' favor. Just barely especially since Greek city-states weren't the best at unilateral war efforts. Within short order, approximately a year, so about 459 BCE, Athens had repelled the Corinthians from Megara with their army of youths and elders, 
much to the disgrace of the Corinthians. And on sea, the Epidorians were likewise defeated, and in 458 BCE, the Athenians landed on Aegina and subjugated the people there. Now, all the while, the Egyptian expedition was going on, but before I touch on that, another related conflict broke out in 458-457 BCE. For the Phocians, an ally of Athens, attacked Doris in central Greece. This is important because this was likely encouraged by Athens given the fact that Doris was the ancient homeland of the Dorians, that is, Sparta. Regardless of whether this was a myth of tradition, Doris was considered a sacred site for the Doric peoples, and the leaders of the Dorians were the Spartans. So, accordingly, the act finally provoked the Spartans into action after they had remained idle and quiet during the warring in the Corinthian Gulf. But given that the Phocians were only supported by Athens and not the Athenians themselves, the Spartans felt assured that they could intervene. Therefore, after the Spartans received the news of Doris's deplorable condition, they marched an army of 11,000 hoplites to retake Doris from the Phocians, skirting Corinth, Megara, and Attica along the way. The Spartans quickly won a decisive takeover of Doris with very little actual fighting, but after their victory, they were in a predicament about how to return home to Laconia. This was on account of the fact that Athens was now openly hostile to the Spartans and were not going to simply let the Spartans return home. Spartan scouts saw that this was the case, so the Spartans did what they always did. They did nothing and waited near Thebes for an opportunity to present itself. This irritated the Athenians, but they too waited, not desiring to meet the Spartans on territory selected by the Spartans themselves, which of course was a recipe for military disaster. Now, this stalemate situation, as well as the previous fighting in the Corinthian Gulf, are often lumped together in one conflict, known as the First Peloponnesian War, but as you have heard, the only thing that truly connects these conflicts is temporality, that is, the timing. The clear hesitance of the Spartans indicates this most clearly, for they very much did not desire to engage with the Athenians directly, because that would mean prolonged war. And despite their military reputation in history, the Spartans had no interest in large-scale warfare, especially outside of the Peloponnese. But when the Athenians amassed a force of 14,000 hoplites to meet some 11,000 Spartans, they no longer had a choice in the matter. Thus, in 457 BCE, the Battle of Tanagra was pitched between the Spartans and Athenians. The Spartans emerged victorious and proceeded back to their homeland via the Corinthian Isthmus. After the departure of the Spartans, the Athenians proceeded, quite unceremoniously, to march back into Boeotia, or Boetia, the land near Thebes, which the Spartans had just occupied, and subjugated the people there and forced them by threat of violence and occupation to enter their Athenian empire. As for the Egyptian expedition, it lasted for six years, as I've said before, from 460 to 454 BCE. The bold endeavor actually began well when the Athenian fleet and their marines, that is, their disembarking soldiers and sailors, took control of the Nile Delta and managed to capture the city of Memphis. But the Persians soon arrived with a massive army led by a one Megabazos and squashed the rebels and the Athenians, as well as their allies, near Memphis. The remaining Athenians and rebels holed up on the delta island of Prosopitis, where they were besieged for 18 straight months, as they hoped and prayed for a relief force to come. So after 18 months of siege warfare, some Athenians managed to escape, but the vast majority lost their lives to the Persian nemesis. A relief force of some 25 to 50 triremes finally did arrive, but they were completely out of the loop and were trapped by the Persian and Phoenician navy and suffered a decisive defeat in 455 or 454 BCE. In total, the Athenians lost some 250 triremes and the soldiers to go along with the ships in their fruitless Egyptian expedition. A low estimate puts the loss of life of the Athenian Empire in excess of 25,000. An absolute disaster in the 5th century when considering that the population of Athens itself at that time was likely below 50,000, including women, children, and slaves. It is nevertheless remarkable that the Athenians managed to conduct all these affairs simultaneously in the 450s BCE, and their capacity to manage such a feat in retrospect was auspicious or foretelling of the approaching dominance by the Hellenic peoples in the decades and centuries to come. Nevertheless, it clearly displayed that Persia was still strong, and that Athens, under the leadership of Pericles, displayed a great deal of hubris. And I point that out because this would not prove to be a reality check for the Athenians, because they would repeat such mistakes during the coming Peloponnesian War. Also circa 454 BCE, the Athenians made excursions into Thessaly, that is in northern Greece, but despite many small victories, they were unable to gain a strong foothold. At the same time, or shortly after, Pericles himself led a short attack into Achaea. In the northern Peloponnese, Pericles was eventually forced to abandon Achaea and return to Athens despite acquiring a few victories. By the time Pericles returned home with his forces, news finally arrived in late 454 BCE of the disastrous outcome of the Egyptian expedition. 
The news went through Athens like a disease or a plague, severely frightening the Athenians and temporarily stifling their resolve. Athens then spent the next three years licking its wounds and using its strength to keep its Athenian empire alive and well. So that three-year gap of peace between 454 to 451 BCE affords me the opportunity to give my thoughts on the so-called First Peloponnesian War. This quote-unquote war stretched from 461 to 445 BCE, but the dates really aren't that important to remember because as I alluded to or mentioned before, the whole war is quite the misnomer. At best, calling the war the First Peloponnesian War gives the wrong impression of what the conflict really was. It really was a sprawling conflict that involved many Greek city-states, but it certainly was not an all-out conflict or a real proper war. What I mean by that is that the largest powers were not interested in direct confrontation. It only happened once at the Battle of Tanagra. In reality, it was a war of maneuvers and staging, because most of it happened circumstantially or by happenstance. The ancient historians do not even speak of this confused warfare between 461 to 445 BCE as a Peloponnesian War. Only later historians, that is, modern historians, do so and I believe that to be disingenuous. The Great Peloponnesian War to come, the real one, was not an accident, and it involved all of Hellas practically from the outset. But this first conflict between Athens and Sparta was very indirect, and only occurred in sputters. Now, despite my remarks, do not discount the brutality of the fighting or the confusion and fear involved in the warfare of the First Peloponnesian War. Whatever it was, it was certainly a dangerous conflict. In 451 BCE, the events picked back up in Hellas. Cimon, do you remember him? Returned from exile, and a five-year truce was agreed to between Sparta and Athens and their allies. The peace would not last for long, but it did give Athens more free reign to once more experiment with their imperial pursuits. The eye of Athens once more turned to Cyprus, and another attempt to wrest the island from Persia and Phoenician control. Pericles, it seems, realized that his military capabilities were limited, so Cimon, in old age, led the Athenian Cyprus expedition in 451. The campaign included 200 ships, but 60 of these triremes were detached to go back to Egypt and try to renew the rebellion under the so-called king in the marshes, Amir Tias. The marshes being the wetlands of the Nile River Delta. But with the rest of the Athenian Empire's force, Cimon laid siege to the city of Kitium. But the fate of the Cyprus campaign was immediately derailed when Cimon died. The reason for his death is unclear, but foul play is not suspected. Cimon, on his deathbed, left orders for the Athenian force to pull back to Salamis and Cyprus, as you can hopefully distinguish from the name, not the same place as the Salamis near Athens, hence the in Cyprus bit. Now Thucydides does not mention this, but Plutarch tells us that Cimon's death was kept temporarily secret in order to preserve the morale of the Athenians, and this is actually a very plausible possibility. Shortly after the Athenians reached the bay at Salamis in Cyprus, the Persians arrived with their navy. Thus, under the command of the deceased Cimon, the Athenians won minor naval victories during the battles off of Salamis and Cyprus. That makes Cimon one of the very few generals in history to score a victory while being dead. Shortly after these skirmishes, though, Cimon's death was announced, and the Athenians decided to return home without a conclusive outcome, although, on the upside, they had not lost a great deal, for the ships they had sent to Egypt managed to come back unscathed. Now, something interesting may or may not have happened in late 451, right before the Athenians returned home from Cyprus, and that is the so-called Peace of Callias. Thucydides mentions nothing of it, but the ancient historian Diodorus claims that a peace treaty, known as the Peace of Callias, was cemented between the Persians and the Greeks. And by Greeks here, we really mean the Athenians, although yes, they represented the Greeks at large at that time. The first mention of such a peace occurred in 380 BCE, mentioned by Isocrates, but the historians of the 4th century BCE were split on the subject. A man named Callias certainly did exist, for he was an emissary sent to the Persian king of kings Artaxerxes, and was specifically mentioned by Herodotus and Plutarch. The fact that Thucydides does not mention such a piece is quite odd, though. Nevertheless, it is rather true that hostilities certainly de-escalated after that point, but that is no definitive evidence that a treaty was agreed upon. Not long after the return of the Athenians from Cyprus, the Second Sacred War broke out. Sacred wars in Greece were wars over sacred Hellenic sites. In 448 BCE, the Phocians, that same ally of the Athenians, took control of the Pan-Hellenic Sanctuary at Delphi. Pan-Hellenic meaning all Greek. Delphi was famous for its oracle, of course, but also its series of treasuries donated by various Hellenic cities, its temple to Apollo, and its Pythian Games, also dedicated to Apollo. Many Hellenic states were disturbed by the seizure of Delphi by the Phocians, so the Spartans marched forth and restored the territory to the Delphians. 
But, of course, after the Spartans left, the Athenians helped the Phocians take it back, which is another instance of the Athenians managing to annoy most of the Hellenic world. It would be some years, but eventually Delphi would return to the Delphians. This second sacred war perhaps wasn't a true violation of the truce between Sparta and Athens, but the Athenian insistence on helping the Phocians strip Delphi from its longtime occupants essentially threw the truce down the drain, because Athens simply could not stop interfering with the rest of Hellas. Between 447 and 445 BCE, Athens suffered from imperial troubles with rebellions in Boeotia, Euboea, and Megara. Boeotia and Euboea were subjugated by Pericles quickly, but the Megarians expelled the Athenian garrison in and around their city and called for assistance from the Peloponnesian states, including Corinth and Epidaurus. Oh, how Greek politics changed quickly. In response, the Peloponnesians, led by Sparta, agreed and decided in roughly 447 or 446 BCE to invade Attica directly. I quote Thucydides from Book 1, Chapter 114, quote, Pericles hurriedly brought the army of Athens back from Euboea, and soon afterwards the Peloponnesians, under the command of King Pleistoanax, the son of Spartan Pausanias, invaded Attica, laying waste to the country as far as Ulysses and Thria. Then, without advancing further, they returned home. End quote. So as you have heard, the Spartans and the Peloponnesians at large were sending a message to the Athenians. Shortly after, in 445 BCE, Athens agreed to a 30 years truce with Sparta and her allies. And for the next decade, Athens dealt with rebellions in Samos and Byzantium, but after much difficulty, both rebel cities were forced back into the Athenian Empire. On the home front, the Athenians began to spend the money of their empire on domestic building projects on their Acropolis, which is not surprising either, considering Pericles had moved the Delian League treasury to the site of the Parthenon, and he did that circa 454 BCE. And this brings the historical narrative up to right about 435 BCE. Thus, this brings to a close the narrative of the Pentaconitia. On the next episode, the mishandling of Epidamnus compels disputes between Epidamnus and Corsaira, and these disputes help to plunge Hellas into decades of grueling warfare. Remember that you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and YouTube, if you so choose, that is, and you can also contact me on the podcast's Facebook page or the email address everythinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. Thank you very much.